Hello everyone, I'm Mike Ward and welcome to Conversations in Healthcare, a series of fireside chats brought to you by DRG, part of Clarivate. This is uh, an opportunity for us to hear firsthand the, sort of the challenges and the opportunities that are facing the healthcare industry um, and you're hearing from the business leaders who are actually sort of, you know, managing those processes. Um, at, you know, particularly when you know, sort of events are in such a sort of a tumult that you know people have to rethink priorities and uh, company strategies. So I'm delighted to be joined by Brian Cully, who's the CEO of Lineage Cell Therapies Inc., uh, which is a publicly quoted uh, clinical stage company that's headquartered in Carlsbad. Uh, California. Uh, the company's lead programs, uh, which are underpinned by a proprietary cell-based platform, are initially targeting AMD, the age-related macular uh, degeneration, uh, acute spinal uh, cord uh, injuries, and uh, uh, NSCLC, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So, um, Brian, uh, Thanks very much for, uh, for, for joining us, and, and I hope you and, and those you care about are, are, are keeping well. well. Thank you for the invitation, Mike. We're doing great, and uh, the same to you. So, uh, so Brian, um, I mentioned you know, in the introduction that uh, you're a, a cell-based uh, therapy company. Now, cell therapies is you know, one of the sort of the hot areas over the past you know, five, 10 years, we've seen this, you know, become a real sort of you know, clinical um, uh, sort of, uh, experience, um, you know, it, it seems to work. What is it that you're doing or what is it, the approach that you have that actually is different from what others are attempting to do? It's a, it's a wonderful question, Mike, because cell therapy encompasses a, a, a lot of different sub areas. Um, and just uh, as a prelude, as a publicly traded company, I just want to make sure that people are aware. I may make some forward-looking statements, and they can learn more about the risk factors at the Securities and Exchange Commission website. Uh, but to directly answer the question, what Lineage does is we manufacture cells in great numbers, and then we control their differentiation, meaning we can then turn them into specific cell types which are then transplanted into the body. So a key difference between us and some other companies is that we don't actually put stem cells into any patients. What we do is we use stem cells as starting material. And then from that starting material, we manufacture specific cell types. For example, specific uh, retina cells or spinal cord cells. And then those are transplanted into the body to help treat or cure conditions or disease. All right. So, and, and, and how do, how do you do that? Is there some sort of um, sort of your magic sauce that sort of makes a stem cell differentiate into a retinal cell as opposed to a sort of spinal cord cell? Yeah, it really is core to our intellectual property. We have the recipe to turn what are called pluripotent cells into other cell types. So the amazing thing about pluripotent cells is that they have the capability of becoming any of the cell types of your body. So a single pluripotent cell might become a liver cell or it might become a kidney or bone or hair cell. It essentially has not decided what to be when it grows up. So we harness that potential to become any of 200 different cell types and we direct their differentiation. So we expose those cells to different conditions and different chemicals, and that's the recipe. And at the end, we're able to obtain pure populations of specific cells. So we can manufacture retina cells from these pluripotent or, or blank page cells. Uh, and by directing their differentiation and controlling it, by developing then that pure population, those are the cells that go into the body to perform the function that is lacking in the patient. All right. So, so, so where did this sort of platform, uh, you know, originate? What, you know, how did you get hold of it? A couple of decades ago, people started dabbling with these pluripotent stem cells and learning how to control their lineage, which of course is the connection to the company's name. 
And uh, there was a gentleman who figured out and published on how to manufacture retina cells. So that was the initiation of our retina program. Uh, and similar recipes have been sorted out for manufacturing certain kinds of spinal cord cells and certain kinds of immune cells. And those are the underpinnings of our spinal cord program and our cancer program. And so those recipes are generally discovered by academics and then we acquire those technologies. And the important thing that we do is we uh, sort of professionalize them. We take them out of the lab and we're able to engineer and introduce the commercial attributes that are required to turn them into actual products from starting as really neat ideas. They need to go through the testing and the maturation so that they can actually become products that can get to patients. Right, so, so, so what comes first? Is it the fact that you're able to, uh, I guess, you know, differentiate one of these stem cells into a particular cell type. And then you look for sort of medical conditions that are associated with those cells. Or mm -hmm. do you look at a, uh, a disease and sort of think, right, uh, let's see if we can sort of develop uh, a, a differentiated cell that actually fits that uh, disease profile? Yeah, the way we approach it is it, we're looking for places where cell therapy is likely to be successful. So for example, in the setting of macular degeneration, and in particular something called dry macular degeneration, which is the more common form, uh, people have tried to develop treatments and therapies, um, small molecules and antibodies, and they haven't worked. They've failed. There is nothing approved in the United States to treat dry age-related macular degeneration. And so our thought there is that um, instead of trying to figure out what's wrong inside of the cell, what if you just replace the entire cell? And approach it like a transplant medicine problem. And so investigators and researchers understand that there may be a better way of approaching macular degeneration by using a whole cell. And that creates the incentive to try to figure out how do we make that kind of cell? There's all sorts of subpopulations and so forth. And if they are able, as they have been, to figure out how to make just that one kind of cell that is lost in that disease, that dies off in that disease, then we're able to approach that as a straightforward transplant problem. And that is where we're trying to show that we can uh, obtain clinically meaningful benefits for those patients. Right. Okay. So, so that means that what you're doing is you're actually replacing sort of uh, dead or dysfunctional retina cells in the patient with <clears throat> um, stem cell differentiated retinal cells. That is exactly right. The hallmark of the disease is that these specialized cells die off and no one knows why it happens. And as human beings, we lack the ability to regenerate those cells. Uh, unlike a cut on your arm, which can heal over time, the cut in your retina that is formed from the loss of these cells and the death of these cells, they're irreplaceable. So you have to go outside to an external source to manufacture new, new retina cells and then introduce them to the body. And that's where we've seen really wonderful results to date. So how long do these retinal cells that you're transplanting, how long do they last? I mean, is that for life or is there a sort of, you know, a normal attrition uh, with retinal cells that you would have sort of re replaced anyway? Yeah, they may last for life. Uh, we have someone from one of the earliest patients who was treated and their cells are still resident after more than four years. Um, they are living cells. They are integrating with the body. And so it is quite reasonable that they may last uh, longer than the person who is uh, supporting them. So um, we, don't, we don't know at this point because it's still in clinical development if this would be a treatment that you might get a couple of times a year or just one time for your life. But um, compared to some other ophthalmology treatments that require a monthly injection or every other month, we're talking about durability that's lasting four years. So we think that's an important advantage. Yeah, sure. And these, they're, the stem cells, they're just from sort of, you know, a universal source. I mean, you don't actually have to derive them from that patient in the first place. No, that's correct. The, the cells are from a cell line 
And so we can thaw the cells out and amplify them in number and then freeze them back down. And then we could come back a year or 10 years later, thaw them out and repeat the process. So we have an infinite supply from this one cell line of which is um, NIH approved in the, in the US. And the beautiful thing about the eye is that there are very few immune cells in the eye. So the fact that these cells are foreign material is um, not problematic because we have never seen a case of either acute or delayed rejection of the cells because your body just doesn't seem to reject things from the eye the way that it might reject material that is injected into the bloodstream. Yeah, and I guess, you know, also because it's an enclosed space, you know, we're not going to get any migration elsewhere either. So there's no sort of like, you know, systemic um, uh, That's risk. right. Yeah. Yes, and the, the fact that the economics here, if you're not starting with a person's own cells and then changing them and putting back, if you're starting with a cell line, you have massive advantages in the economics. So at this point, we are already able to manufacture 5 billion retina cells in a single three liter container. So the, the cost of producing these cells in great numbers relative to the 100,000 that we administer, <clears throat> it really makes it an economically advantaged method. Yeah, I was gonna ask, yeah, so how many cells do you put in? Yeah, it's 100,000. And so, the sort of clinical development. This is this is the clinic. It's phase one, two A. So, wh where are we in terms of you know actually getting into patients? Yeah, the um, there are about nineteen, eighteen to twenty patients who have been treated so far. Um, they fall into two different categories. So the first twelve patients, they were all legally blind. So you're not going to do much harm to someone if they're already legally blind. So that is a safety component. And then after those first 12 patients, we're now working on the second set of 12 patients. And these are people who have got higher levels of baseline vision. Uh, they, they might even be able to still drive a car, but they definitely have the disease and they're definitely impaired. And this is, uh, this is the patient population that we really think of as the future customers for this kind of a treatment. And so we're in phase one, two A testing, which means we're looking at both safety as well as some early signs of efficacy. And, and we are seeing changes in vision that are uh, directionally encouraging for this approach. Right, now clearly, um, you know, COVID uh, and the pandemic has had a big impact on the ability of you know clinical centers to to run clinical trials or even if patients actually wanting to present to uh, uh to clinics H how has COVID 19 sort of you know, impacted you know your efforts in in the sort of the retinal cell uh trial and other um trials that you're running uh, probably like many companies, it has slowed things down. Uh, participating in a clinical trial is elective. Uh, people do not need to enter our, our clinical study. And most of the patients which we treat <clears throat> are elderly because they are essentially outliving their retina cells. So we absolutely were affected by a slowdown. Um, but more recently, things have um, improved and we're, we're seeing greater numbers of patients that are screening. We just treated somebody a couple of days ago. So we're, we're back and, and operating and I expect that we'll be able to finish enrolling this study before the end of the year, which has been our plan. So it's, it's definitely been a challenge, but um, we're getting through it, which I believe speaks to the importance or the severity of someone losing their vision. They're willing to go out there and, and risk infection by going and, and, and going to not just the surgery, but also the follow-ups that are required for this clinical trial. Yeah, and I guess in sort of spinal cord injuries, you're, you're looking at a sort of almost like a different age demographic. It's, it's more likely to be young people who are active that have uh, you know, got those injuries. So, so what, what's happening in, in, in that space? Yeah, it's, you're exactly right. It's sort of the other end of the spectrum. It's just uh, heartrending because you have these, these kids who are on the, you know, just beginning to set out in life. I was talking yesterday with a former participant on our spinal cord program, and uh, his accident occurred the day before his graduation. Uh, now, he happens to be doing really well. He's a senior in college, and, and he had a wonderful response on the clinical trial. 
So we have treated 25 people who have spinal cord injuries. Um, and similar to what we're doing with retina is we're manufacturing a special kind of cell which exists in your spinal cord and only that kind of cell um, using similar starting material from stem cells. And then we go through that recipe to make these spinal cord cells and then transplant those into these individuals. And that usually happens three to six weeks after their injury. And what we're trying to do is provide these individuals with greater mobility and recovery after a paralyzing accident. And just like with our retina program, we have seen some outstanding and really remarkable results in some of our patients treated to date. So we're very excited about continuing to move that program forward. Right. Now, you, you mentioned that you have the, sort of, you know, the manufacturing you know, capability because you, know, you can produce 5 billion cells in, in, in uh, you know, a 3 litre uh, flask. What, what is the, the sort of, I guess, the sort of the commercial business plan for, you know, the sort of the development of these programs? Is it something that you're going to try and do all yourselves or are you courting uh, potential uh, pharmaceutical partners? Yeah, uh, ultimately that decision resides in an analysis of the, the benefit to our shareholders. So there are some scenarios where holding on to these assets and taking them farther can make more sense. And then there are some scenarios where going into an alliance with an international uh, pharmaceutical company and enjoying the benefit of all of their resources, their, their capital, their capabilities, their contacts and networks and experiences uh, can make a lot of sense as well. So we don't have a decision today. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But what I can say is that we are approaching the end of a clinical study in dry age-related macular degeneration. So this is becoming important and we are now speaking with some of these international multi-disciplinary uh, 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 companies about potentially working with them. Yeah, and, and the sort of the, the cell platform you've got, is there any any sort of reason why, uh, or any sort of restrictions to the kind of cells that it, you might be able to sort of differentiate into? Um, it's a, there's a practical answer and, and a theoretical answer. Uh, the practical answer is yes, without enough resources um, and time, it, it might be difficult to figure out how to make a particular cell type. Um, but the theoretical answer is no. In theory, because we know that the starting material is, uh, you know, by definition, able to become everything that makes you who you are, eye, bone, hair, blood, um, it, ha it has the capabilities. Now, unlocking it and figuring out the recipe, that requires a lot of, of work. Um, and we're very fortunate that we've, we've got those recipes now for three different clinical stage programs. But to expand the platform and do additional cell types uh, is just a matter of resources. Um, but we've, we've seen examples where people are working on islet cells for diabetes and other types of cells, liver cells for, uh, for other liver diseases. So, you know, in theory, cell therapy could be deployed in, in innumerable locations. Right. And, you know, when you're sort of dealing with the, uh, the regulators, what are the, you know, sort of the potential red flags when sort of, you know, developing this approach? Uh, are you having to sort of think about and, and address? Yeah, there are a couple of them that, that come up. This, this is really a, a newer area. Uh, the regulators are more accustomed to very discrete compounds and there's a path and a process. And so we're all going through this together and working through it together. Um, one of the challenges in cell therapy is the cells, they, they all are slightly different. You know, they each have a little bit of different uh, decoration on their exterior. And so it's very important to show the regulators that you have the ability to uh, manufacture pure material every single time the same way because they really get distressed if, if you're putting variable material in people. Um, they also have concerns about things like these cells uh, dividing and becoming uh, cancerous. Now there hasn't been any ev evidence of that. We've had many people treated for many years so that looks to us for our approach to be more theoretical than actual 
And of course, we test ourselves for these kinds of, of matters. But those are examples of the kinds of things that the regulators want to see evidence that you've thought about, you've tested, and you've minimized those risks. And so far, everything has been looking very good. All right. so, so, Brian, you've you know, been in the industry now for about 25 years. Um, and I mean, you joined, uh, I, I think, Lineage uh, a couple of years ago, uh, sort of the fall of uh, uh, 2018. In, in that time, I mean, obviously, you've seen uh, a huge amount of a sort of change. I was going to say evolution, but in fact, revolution within the sort of the biotech space. Um, what 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 are sort of the key learnings have you had did you bring to lineage that you'd actually sort of accumulated over that that previous you know couple of decades or so of you know working in the industry yeah i i think lineage and, and part of the reason i was attracted to the company and wanted to join it is that the whole field of cell therapy is about to go through a maturation so for many years now, people have been talking um, in general terms about the promises of cell therapy and how it's going to help with Parkinson's and autism and all of these things. And it's on magazine covers and you read about it everywhere, but it needs to mature as an industry. What, and what I mean by that is those ideas are wonderful, but they need to be tested in randomized and comparative clinical trials. And only then, will you see these approaches be demonstrated as effective and approved by the regulators and uh, reaching patients. And Lineage is one of the pioneers in this space, which is responsible for that maturation and showing the, the clear and convincing evidence that if you put these cells in a patient, that you're gonna get this outcome because of those cells. And I think we're gonna see an explosion in activity in cell therapy as these companies go through the clinical testing, which is required to move from the promises to the reality. And that excites me to be part of that process and to help lead that process. Right. Now we touched on uh, sort of you know, COVID-19 and sort of the impact it's had on, say for example, clinical trials. Um, what other sort of you know, impacts has it had on your ability, you know, in terms of, you know, talking to, to investors or actually sort of, you know, manufacturing uh, the, the, the cells what, what sort of changes have you had to you know introduce to your company to I guess sort of mitigate the the, 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 the risks or the sort of the challenges associated with the pandemic yeah there are two that come to mind and and they're actually quite minor so one is that most of us work from home now um, but as uh, you know being able to have an overview of the organization, you know, we're, we're perhaps even more productive uh, in this new environment. So being a biotech company that has the ability to have a large number of its staff work from home, uh, from that perspective, COVID hasn't been too, too harmful. The other one which comes to mind is that we had to take some very minor steps. So for example, we were not sure if there were going to be disruptions to supply chains. So pre-purchasing certain chemicals and reagents just to make sure that there was a constant supply. Uh, those were some of the smaller steps that, that really they, you know, they're barely noticeable. Uh, and with respect to manufacturing, we have a subsidiary with about 30 employees, which is located in Israel. And they've had good periods and bad periods, but um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a region, the, the, the virus has, has um, you know, been more present or, or less present. But that manufacturing facility is an essential service and it has been open and, and monitored and running. And you know, ironically, those people dress up in full protective gear from head to toe, and they're working in some of the cleanest rooms imaginable. So in some ways, our manufacturing team are in the safest place in the world. So we've been very fortunate that aside from clinical trial enrollment, our operations have really not been affected much by COVID. Yeah. So, so Brian, uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for taking the time to, uh, to talk to me today. Um, yeah interesting sort of the journey that you're taking uh, and I think a lot of people are going to be you're very interested to sort of see the progress you make uh, with that that cell therapy approach um, uh, it sounds it sounds very exciting um, 
So if after listening to, uh, to, to this broadcast, um, you'd like to tune into other uh, conversations in healthcare, uh, please follow our LinkedIn page because that's where we'll be posting uh, notices about future episodes. Um, so in closing, I, I'd like to thank uh, Brian again for, 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 for joining me and I'd like to thank the, uh, the listeners for uh, tuning in. So until next time, stay safe and healthy. Uh, I'm Mike Ward and I'll see you in the next episode.